Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to, to study your word. Father, we just thank you for being in a place where, you know, we're not heavily persecuted and we can heavily study. Lord, give us opportunity, Father, to be able to minister to those who cannot go deep and study because of their persecution. Father, give us opportunity to minister to them and give them the word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Part three. Part three of the 18 attributes of a good steward. <coughs> so we've been talking about a couple things. Um, just kind of small recap. Uh, we've been talking about the first one is we have an assignment. We're supposed to cultivate and protect. We're supposed to work and keep. So whenever he gave Adam it was an assignment, okay? So stewardship is about an assignment. You've been given an assignment. You've been given a responsibility on this earth. You will give an account for at the end of your days. And it won't matter what your excuses are. Well, my wife wasn't supportive. It doesn't matter. You don't answer your wife. And in reality, she answers you. You're the authority, and you'll answer God because he's your authority. <laughs> I'm not saying that we don't uh, serve our wives because the Bible says uh, those who are the least of these will be the greatest. But in the actuality, as a, as a husband, you are the head of the home. So you've got to lead your wife. But I'm not trying to get off on that necessarily. I'm talking about the fact that there isn't anything that's going to get in the way. God's gonna, God, you're going to have to answer God for the way you live your life. Okay, and you have to give an account for the assignment he's given you. Okay, so it's important to seek him with all your heart. Figure out what that assignment is and do it. Amen. <clears throat> um, so part of cultivation is protect and multiply, defend it and make it better, right? All right, second thing we learned was it's helping, we help carry a burden. We're carrying God's burden on the earth. We're co-laborers, 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We're co-workers in God's service, okay? <clears throat> Acts chapter 6. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip past that. Okay, love. Uh, the third thing we learned was that a good steward loves correction, okay? Anyone who rebukes a mocker will be, get an insult in return. Anyone who corrects the wicked will get hurt. Don't bother mocking, correcting mark, mockers. They will only hate you, but correct the wise, and they will love you. Instruct the wise, and they'll be even wiser. Teach the righteous, and they will learn even more. Okay, so good stewards love correction. The reason why is because a good steward isn't serving himself. A good steward is serving someone else. And so if I was to make you a meal that you absolutely hate, would I be a good steward of giving you a meal that you hate every day? You know what I mean? Or would it be better if I actually love you to find out what you want and give what you want? Does that make sense? So we can't say, I'm going to do what I want to do, and God better be happy with it. See what I'm saying? Because I'm giving my best. Well, first of all, God created you. He knows what you're supposed to do. You don't, actually. <laughs> we need to know what God wants us to do, and we do what he says. Sometimes that means we're supposed to be an accountant. Sometimes that means we're supposed to be a book writer. Sometimes that means we're supposed to be a preacher. Sometimes that means we're supposed to be a garbage man. You know what I'm saying? You need to know what it is your purpose is and what God's really... How can you most effectively serve God? I got a guy, a friend of mine, who's a garbage man here in Brownwood, and he goes and does garbage, and he preaches the gospel when he sees people, and they come out and bring us deal, and he checks on them, prays for them, and all that. He sees people he ain't ever going to see, except when he's doing the, the trash pickup. Come on, right? Yeah. Some people are never going to go to church, but going to see the trash man. See what I'm saying? So we have a purpose and a calling. We got to, it's not always, you know, and it's always, it's not always noble either. Think about that for a minute. It's not always noble. We always want to be that fine china in that cabinet. We always want to be that preacher up there on the stage or whatever. Well, he's the one who's important. He's not important. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter four that he gave the, the he gave the fivefold, which is the, the <clears throat> apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and the evangelist to equip the saints for work of ministry. 
So those guys are supposed to be people who empower you to do the work. Make sense? So, amen. I gotta share something. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, till <the> <laughs> Wait till he hit. Write it down. Write it down. All right. The fourth thing we learned was faithful with the little. It'll make it for a good discussion later. All right. Faithful with the little. Romans chapter 14, verse 12. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. This entire life is something we are to steward and we will give an account. And then we read the parable of the talents about the danger of burying the talents and also that the talents isn't a gifting. The talent was money in the parable. It's symbolic of responsibility. It was $1.4 million is what a talent was in today's money. Okay? So somebody got five talents and somebody got two talents and somebody got one. And the guy who got one, he got scared and he buried it. And that's a very bad thing. The Bible says, you wicked and slothful servant. So he equates laziness with wickedness. Mm. Mm. Well, I didn't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The Bible says if we'll seek God with all of our heart, we will find him. You, you can know God's will for your life. You don't have to guess. Okay? There are some things that are cookie-cutter, Everybody, this is the will of God. Take care of the least of these. If you, if, you, if you just want to serve the least of these, you can't go wrong there. You, 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 you'll hit, miss, and get it at the same time if you just go serve the least of these. You won't get it wrong. Let me say that, let me say that again. If you just serve the least of these, you won't get it wrong. Okay? How can you serve someone? I had someone tell me one time in college, <clears throat> I asked them if they wanted to do something about, I can't remember what it was. This is a pretty simple thing I was asking. It wasn't a very complex thing. I said, like, well, let me pray about it. I'll have to pray about it. I said, if you saw somebody, I think it was about evangelism. I said, you really need to be, we need to share the gospel. Well, I'll pray about it. Something like that. And I said, well, if you saw somebody sitting at the table over there crying their eyes out, would you have to pray about it to go and put your arm around them and love on them? You know, or couldn't you just be moved with compassion? Too many times we want to get too super spiritual and be like, well, God didn't lead me to do that. You know, when Jesus came on the earth and the Bible says he got off the boat and he saw the crowd and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Jesus was not always led by the Holy Spirit. He was led by compassion. Compassion is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> compassion I mean obviously there's some times where the Holy Spirit will lead you not to go there's actually more times when, Jesus, when the Holy Spirit will lead you not to go versus leading you to go okay so when Paul the apostle was given the command go into all the world and preach the gospel that's all he needed he didn't need a word from God he, he didn't need any more word from God he didn't need any other what, have you ever heard of this phrase whatever's written you don't need to actually hear if it's written, you don't, need a, you don't need a special word from God. It's already written. It's written. Go and preach the gospel, therefore, to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? Making disciples of all nations. So that's a command that's written down. You don't have to pray about it. It's, it's written down. And he told all of his believers, all of his followers, go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You don't have to pray about that. So Paul, he just did that. He just went. And then he finally heard the Holy Spirit tell him not to go into Asia. Why? Because he was so committed to the written word, or written to, or, or committed to, at least to the Great Commission, which maybe not have been written down yet, but he was committed to the written word and he was committed to the commands of Jesus, go into all the world making disciples, that he just went into all the world and made disciples. He, he was obedient. And the Holy Spirit had to stop him from going into Asia and redirect him in a dream where he saw a man from Macedonia and said, come and preach to us. So then he didn't go to Asia because God stopped him. How many of us are so gung-ho about preaching the gospel we literally had to not share the gospel somewhere because God told us not to? 
But we're so busy waiting on to hear God to go do something. Just go do it. If he don't want you to do it, he'll tell you. Trust me, if you're obedient, he'll want you to know not to go somewhere. The Bible says, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I think it's Isaiah, right? It says, I'll tell you to take a left. I'll tell you to take a right. But you can't, you can't get that direction from God unless you start moving. I never really started hearing God until I started actually obeying what I did hear originally. Let me say that again. I didn't actually start hearing God until I started obeying what I heard originally. And what you hear originally is what's written. What's written. So I started preaching the gospel. When I started preaching the gospel to people on the street, that's when real, real revelation started hitting me that I never had before. You get way more revelation from preaching the gospel than you ever did reading your Bible. Wait a minute, Zach, don't say that. I'm just saying, when you go actively do what God tells you to do, He starts to reveal things to you about the Scripture. You'll start getting a word, then you'll read it. And you're like, whoa, God just spoke that to me already. And then you read it after He spoke to you. All right, anyway, people say, well, I want to hear God. Obey, just obey what you know. Then you'll start hearing God. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, so being faithful a little. All right, so let's get to our, our new thing we're going to be talking about today. Number five is, attribute number five. <laughs> <clears throat> we're a blessing to those we serve. <clears throat> so previously... We talked about the about what a steward is. That a steward is someone who acts who who is a servant who acts like a ruler. Okay, they are a they are a person who's been given something that doesn't belong to them to take care of it for someone else. Okay, so this earth has been given to mankind. We've been given authority over the earth, but we're stewards because ultimately it belongs to God. See what I'm saying? He just gave us charge over it. We're a steward. Okay, we're a blessing to those we serve. Genesis chapter 39, verse 4 through 6. So Joseph found favor in his sight. Who's that? Potiphar. So he was a slave. I want you to notice something about Joseph. Joseph never allowed his title and his position to hinder him from his influence. Let me say it again. Joseph never allowed his title and position to hinder him in his influence because he was influential, period. He knew who he was. He had a glimpse from God that people would bow down to him. So he had a revelation that he was something more than a slave. But God took him into slavery. What time do you got to go right now? No. He took him into slavery. I know that sounds weird, but he did. <clears throat> because the Bible says later on, he says, what you meant for evil, God meant to save many lives. Now, that's kind of weird to say. I don't like to say that um, God wants to punish you or, or it's not God's will. Okay, let me put it this way. It's not God's will that people get thrown into slavery. I don't believe that's the will of God. Okay, but God is able to turn even the bad things that happen to us into good things. Okay, I don't think it was God's will that Joseph would, be, would later on be falsely accused of rape and then thrown into prison for something he never did. You see what I'm saying? God's not a God of injustice. So I can't attribute his slavery and or even necessarily his... I have a difficult time attributing his slavery and his imprisonment for unjust reasons as necessarily God's perfect will. Okay? On the other hand, a lot of what Joseph does is very much type and shadow of Jesus Christ. He became a humble servant, right? Then he was falsely accused. He was punished for sin he never committed. In fact, he was punished for someone else's sin. Think about that, because it was Joseph uh, Potiphar's wife that tried to get him to sleep with her and commit adultery. And he said no, and he went to prison for her sin. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> so, there's a lot of type and shadows of Joseph and Jesus, and then... The Bible says that Jesus was given the name above all names, exalted, only subject to God the Father. The Bible says, Jesus says that God the Father is greater than I am. 
and it says that he will give him all the kingdoms on the last day in 1 Corinthians. Okay, so same thing happened with Joseph. Joseph was thrown into prison, I mean slavery, then he was thrown into prison, and then he was exalt, exalted to second command over all of Egypt. It says that when he spoke, it was like Pharaoh speaking. His authority was equal, but also submitted to Pharaoh. See what I'm saying? All right, let's get over here. So Joseph found favor in his sight, this Potiphar, and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. So he went from slave to ruler of slaves. From the time, did y'all know we're just slaves? We just have to get over it. We only become rulers of slaves. <laughs> we're all slaves. You either serve the devil or you serve God. You only exchange hands. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Whoa. So the Egyptian, who was not a godly person, was actually blessed because Joseph was godly and humble and a good servant. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, that's Joseph, he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. Wow. So Potiphar had a servant in his home that took care of everything for him. All Potiphar had to do was eat. Isn't that wild? <coughs> and we get bitter and resentful when we work for a boss and says, well, where's the boss? Why isn't he out here helping us? Joseph didn't have that heart. And because of that, Joseph, God had big plans for Joseph. You know what's happening? You know, when people complain, I tell people, when you complain about your bosses when you're working, <clears throat> that's the reason why you'll never amount to much. Let me say it again. When you complain about your bosses, no matter whether you work for a, an un ungodly man or a godly man, because Joseph, Joseph was working for an ungodly man, okay? He was working for a pagan man, right? So we should give honor to our leaders and our bosses and things like that because it actually sets us up it sets them up for success but it also sets us up for success as well in god's eyes well what if i always stay at this job and die in this job and you know never amount to much after this you, you don't get it jesus said the least among you will be the greatest in the kingdom of god you, this world is so temporary you're gonna when you wake up in eternity you're going to look at this life and say, it was so short. If you lived 100 years, if you lived 900 years, you still look at this life and say, it's just a blip in my life. What was I thinking? Why did I waste that little time I had? Like the time you have is so precious It's because it's scarce. It's so tiny, the time that you have. Make sense? Uh, <clears throat> helping carry the burden. <coughs> so Joseph, he was then thrown into prison, okay, because he's falsely accused. The Bible says that when he went to prison, he the the prison jail he became the prison jail leader, okay, shot collar. <laughs> Actually, more like a trustee, not shot caller. <laughs> he, 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 came, he was in, put in charge of the jail, okay, because of his faithfulness and his devotion. And, we, again, we get so wrapped up in, well, I made someone else rich. I made so, I, all my hard work made them. You don't get it. That is the blessing of God on your life. Don't resent it or you might lose that. You won't be a blessing to anyone, even yourself. See what I'm saying? You say, <laughs> make sense? When we start resenting making someone else rich, man, I'll tell you what, this, this story, Joseph, made me as a kid say, whoever I work for, I want to bless their socks off. Whenever I go work for somebody, I want them to be rich. And so that's the reason why I got promoted quickly in my jobs. Because in my mind, I wanted to be like Joseph for another person. Because I knew God destined me for uh, a leadership role. Does that make sense? So 
I wanted to be a blessing to other people. So when I was working at CeCe's Pizza, you know, we passed inspections like we never had before. God blessed me and he blessed the business. When I left, when I was telling them I was leaving, they're like, is it money? We'll give you more money. You know, they wanted me to stay. So the thing is, you've, you've got to realize that it's big, always bigger than me and you. Always bigger than me and you. And God's judging and watching everything that you do. How are you, how are you treating your boss today? How are you, when you go get a job outside, when you work here at the barracks or when you go at the job outside at the barracks, how are you, are you being a blessing to that person? Okay, because you're a light even in your workspace. Like I said earlier, it's not just about being a preacher. When you work at a job, everybody, you know, a lot of times we come to the barracks and we're like, y'all need to think about serving at the ministry. We're always talking about that. But I mean, honestly, 99% of the guys who come to this program are not going to stay with the ministry. They're going to go back into the world. So what are we talking about? Like, why am I preparing you for ministry? here at the barracks when I should be preparing you for ministry at your next job. Make sense? Not, most people don't stay. One out of a hundred might stay. And that's a calling and a purpose they feel called to do, and they should obey that if they, if they feel called to do that. But I think it's unfair for me to impose on every single student, you're called to be in the ministry. I don't think it's, wrong. I don't think it's right. One out of a hundred people might stay. And even then, they might only stay for a little bit. Uh, John Maxwell says in his book, uh, those who start with you will not, will not finish with you. In his, his book called The Leader's Greatest Return. I didn't even read the chapter. I just read the, I, just re I haven't got there yet. But I read the title, the stub title, and I thought, oh, I feel so, bad, so much better now. <laughs> you know, because when you have a vision especially as a higher level leader, your, your vision goes well beyond people's tenure. Their vision is for when they're living with you now, and, then, and you're going to help them get to their next chapter. Does that make sense? Sometimes that next chapter would be with you. Sometimes their second, third, fourth chapter is with you, but their fifth chapter is not. <clears throat> All right. So Joseph, what were we saying? Joseph was... Uh, a blessing everywhere he went, okay? So when he got to working for Potiphar, he blessed him, and God blessed Potiphar because of Jacob. And the same thing happened, I mean, with Joseph. And the same thing happened with Jacob. The Bible says that Jacob worked for Laban, and God blessed Laban because of Jacob. All right. <clears throat> Number six, integrity. I'm missing a scripture that I want to have in here. Oh, I have it. Finishing what we start. Okay. Where are we at? Verse uh, number six. Integrity. So now we're in integrity. First Corinthians chapter four, verse one through twenty. I'm mean going through two. This is the way any person is to regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. Trustworthy. This is one of the major key components uh, for promotion and for stewardship. Um, oftentimes, people might be a hard worker, but they might not be honest. I've had that happen before. <laughs> Make sense? <coughs> Must be <coughs> found trustworthy. <coughs> what does trustworthy mean? Worthy of trust. Worthy of trust. You can depend on them. They're not liars, right? They're not manipulators. They don't have hidden agendas. That first thing she was saying is that you can depend on them to have the same morals, values, and standards that you have. 
Yeah, well, and these are these are kind of like superficial things. Then there's deeper things of integrity. <clears throat> um, I can trust you with my treasure. I trust you with my treasure. There's different levels of treasure, right? I might trust you with a code on the door. I might trust you to handle the money at the fundraiser. I might trust you to drive a vehicle. And then there's the, I might trust you to watch my kids. There's different treasures, you see what I'm saying? And different levels. And just because I don't trust you with one doesn't mean I don't trust you at all. Just means you haven't gotten to that level yet. Make sense? Trusting with treasure, okay? Trust you with treasure. Powerful one right there. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his wife's master, his, his, ma his master's wife, <clears throat> cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. He's not talking about lying, like telling a lie. She's talking about the other kind of lying around, you know. I'm saying sex, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house and he has put everything that he has in my charge, trusting with treasure, everything, right? He is not greater in this house than I am. Wow. So Potiphar had promoted him to such a point where he wasn't even viewed as a slave anymore. He was viewed as the master of the home. See? He's not greater in this house than I am. Nor has he kept back anything from me except you. And there's some treasures that you'll never, ever get to cross the line on, right? Because they're only for one person. <clears throat> this is but for you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see that? His sin wasn't even, he wasn't even considering his sin against Potiphar. He was considering this sin to be a sin against God. <clears throat> and as he spoke, and this is the reason why Joseph operated in such integrity. He feared the Lord. It wasn't man that he was fearing. It wasn't man he was submitting to. The reason why Joseph was so successful as a steward of man's things was because he was a good steward of God's things and vice versa. Because the Bible says, how can you be trusted with heavenly riches if you can't be trusted with earthly riches? So there's a, there's a duo thing here, right? If you're faithful with the earthly things, God will trust you with heavenly things. So we always want to jump to ministry. We always want to jump to doing something for the kingdom. Sometimes the kingdom begins, in fact, every time the kingdom begins in the natural. If you can't be faithful with washing your clothes every week, if you can't be faithful with cleaning up after yourself, if you can't be faithful with doing what your boss asks you to do when he says to ask you to do it, how can God trust you with heavenly things? Because they're more precious. You see what I'm saying? Heavenly things are more precious than earthly things. So be a good steward of the earthly things, and then God will give you heavenly things. Okay? How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as he spoke to Joseph, day, as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. <clears throat> so I don't think it's even sex necessarily. I think it's just sitting on the couch together. He didn't even want to go that far. Because we know when you play with fire and gasoline, you get a little boom boom. You know what I mean? A little boom boom. <laughs> Don't mix fire with gasoline. Lie beside her or be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled out of the house fled out of the house. He ran. He ran for it. He ran away. I love that part. 
Why? Why did Joseph run? He knew if he said he would have done it. Because there are just some things you should never put yourself in. There are some situations you should never put yourself in if you expect to win. Yeah. That's why we have boundaries. As men of God, we have to have boundaries that are well, well, far, far enough back away from the actual sin. But so many times we want to get right up to the edge and hope it won't fall off. I remember being a little kid. My dad and I were talking about it yesterday, the day before, <clears throat> not going camping. And there was, uh, there was this, we were in Yosemite Park. And my, I was a little kid, uh, maybe, maybe fifth or sixth grade. And, you know, when you go with your dad and you're going to camping sites and stuff like that, and you go down the trails, you start to run ahead, right? Run ahead, run ahead. And then my dad always let us kind of run ahead and climb things and never really, you know, uh, he, he was always pretty cool about it. Like, yeah, just let him have fun. Well, we went on this trail with my dad, me and my brother, and my mom stayed back, and we were running ahead, and my dad knew that there was a cliff. I can't remember how, 700-foot cliff, huge, and he yelled at us, stop, right? And we all, walk here with me, got us close, you stay with me the rest of the way, right? You don't go ahead, and so I remember we got up to the edge of that cliff. And <clears throat> when we got close enough, about from here to that wall right over there, uh, that my dad said, all right, get on your hands and knees. So we got on our hands and knees. We're going to crawl to the edge. And you're going to stay on your belly. And so we just eased up all the way to the edge. And I remember looking over that cliff. We were on one of them cliffs like this. It, it wasn't like a cliff like this. It wasn't a cliff like this. It was a cliff like this. <laughs> we were out over this shelf, over this canyon. And I remember being over like this. And the, I've never been afraid of heights before, you know, as a kid. And when I looked over, I remember just, I could feel myself falling over the edge. <laughs> you know? And my stomach was churning and like, whoa! My goodness, like it was, even now thinking about it right now, I get goosebumps because it's just, it's a wild experience, right? And anyway, my point is we do that too much with sin. We like to get right up to the edge of sin and hope we won't fall off. You know what I mean? Why? I think, I don't know, maybe because we, I honestly, I think it's because we love darkness. We love darkness and we don't want to admit it. I think... I don't think there's any question. I don't know if I've ever met anyone, to be honest with you, that doesn't love darkness. We love, there's something about us that loves darkness. And uh, people don't want to admit that. People, people want to say, oh, human beings are good. No, we're not. We're wicked. The Bible says that there is not one righteous man. Now, he's talking about Israel, but I believe it applies to the world, too. We want our wickedness. We, we do. And I can't tell you how many times I've shared the gospel with people and say, oh, I'm not ready I'm thinking, why don't you just give your life to Jesus? Well, I'm not ready. Because they, in their heart, they know they're not really ready to surrender to God. They want to keep living their life, you know. <clears throat> but I think um, those who belong to God, those who've, who've there's, there's people who like their wickedness, but we also do love the light. There's a, a part of us that wants to do the right thing. And so there comes a point where you've got to say, I don't even want to play with that fire. I love God. And so the only way you're going to do that is if you practice loving God, just like you practice your sin. You know the reason why we, it's, it's, we, we get addicted to that sin. We, we do the sin over and over and over again, and we want more and we want more, and it never satisfies. That's why we keep going back. It never satisfies. We do it and immediately regret it. Like, and if you don't regret it anymore, then you've seared your conscience. And it escalates. And it escalates. But when we love God... It does satisfy, and we can't get enough. We want more. But it does satisfy, too, at the same time. It's kind of a strange thing. Sin never satisfies. You're always disappointed. But you never get disappointed with God. It just fulfills. And then you're like, I want more. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so I've learned for myself, you know, that 
I do love righteousness and I do want God. There's a part of me that wants darkness. And Paul was able to relate with that in the scriptures. The Bible says this, though, in Galatians. Paul wrote this, too. If you set your mind on the things of the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so it really comes down. I'm not trying to get into sin and temptation uh, teaching here, but we're on it, so we might as well mention it. Um, but <clears throat> the key is to set your mind Set your mind. Well, I can't stop looking at porn. Well, before you looked at porn, what were you doing? Well, I binge watch. I binge watch. <laughs> oh, look at porn. No. Before you looked at porn, what were you doing? I know what you were doing. You were going through Facebook for hours on end. Or you were watching uh, Netflix, binge watching a TV show. Or you were hanging out with the wrong people. Or what, what, what led to the sin that you regret were other smaller compromises that you didn't feel so bad about. Let me say it again. What led to the sin that you regret are the small compromises that you felt okay about it. So, for instance, come lie with me. She didn't say have sex with me, even though we know what the intentions were. But let's just say for kicks that it didn't mean have sex. Let's just say for kicks it meant lie with. What's so wrong with sitting on the couch with her? What's so wrong with somebody cuddling up together? Because it leads to sin, right? So, <laughs> so what, did, what did Joseph do? He drew the barrier back. He drew the barrier way back. Don't even touch my garments, woman. Don't even come near me. You know what I'm saying? There, there comes a point, and it's not like, oh, well, are we afraid to sin? Yes, yes, we're afraid to sin. <laughs> There should be a fear. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is to turn away from evil. The fear, it's not that I fear, it's not that I'm fearing sin. Yeah, and it's the beginning of wisdom too. There's multiple scriptures, that, but yeah, one of the scriptures says the fear of God is to turn away from wickedness. So if I love God and if I fear the Lord, it's not that I'm afraid of sin, I fear the Lord. I, fearing the Lord is to turn away. So that means that I'm going to put up safeguards. I'm going to put up boundaries that that prevent me, I mean, it's just like, it's just like the gas stations, right? They put little signs, no smoking, right? Why? Because you're around gas, <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's not even play. Let's not even joke. Let's not even tempt it. Let's not even get close. You see what I'm saying? Could you smoke cigarettes around a gas can and not ever blow up? Maybe, probably. But why are they doing those signs? Because they don't want to play. They don't want to even play. We should do the same. Especially if we have a tendency to return back to a, specific, a particular sin, we should not play. You see what I'm saying? All right, I got way off. <clears throat> Stewardship. Being trustworthy. So we see here, we're not going to go to the next point. We're just going to end here. <clears throat> this uh, particular thing is talking about, it is talking about resisting sin. So this passage is talking about resisting sin. But it's about being trustworthy. So integrity is not just not sinning. Let me say it again. Integrity is not just not sinning. Integrity is creating proper boundaries for yourself so you never even play with it. You don't even get close to it. Okay? That's integrity. Integrity is drawing spiritual lines. Drawing spiritual boundaries and physical boundaries. I got tired of relapsing on porn. And so I just said, I've had enough. I'm not going to have a, I told my wife, here's what I told my wife. It, I'm, it's not worth it to me to have a phone anymore without protection. I'm going to have something. I'm, I'll, if I, it's not worth it to me to pay for a cell phone if I'm not willing to pay for accountability. And people will say, well, are you walking in freedom if you always have to have an accountability app? Yes, actually, I am. Because walking in freedom is not lack of boundaries or restrictions. True freedom is imposing self-boundaries and self-restrictions. Why? Because the Bible says my people perish for lack of vision, and for lack of prophetic vision, they cast off restraint. And the most powerful people in the world who had never sinned in the world 
who had never yet sinned, Adam and Eve, they were sinless in the garden. God gave them a restriction. So if I have a restriction, it is not evidence of lack of freedom. It's evidence of the fact that I can self-govern. Look, self-govern. Look, watch this. What is the definition of self-control? It's control. You, you're controlling yourself. That means you're restricting yourself. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with imposing a physical restriction on yourself if you must in order to prevent yourself from going down a road you do not want to go down. True freedom, listen, true freedom is being able to submit to boundaries that you've, that you've allowed to be put on, your, on yourself. We, we, we mistaken the idea. We think, well, I'm, I'm, I got these rules and regulations. Rules and regulations are not evidence of slavery. They're evidence of authority. God gave man and Adam and Eve, get Adam and Eve authority over the entire earth. And when he did so, he gave them a restriction. When they had never sinned. And we always think, well, these handcuffs mean that I'm a prisoner. You see what I'm saying? That's we immediately think of a restriction as a handcuff. Well, I'm a prisoner because I did something wrong. No, no, no. You know what must be restrained? Powerful things. Let me say it again. You know, you know what must be restrained? You're gonna listen to my teaching on authority of the believer. I'm talking about this. What must be restrained are not dangerous things or bad things, it's powerful things. Because powerful things without restraint become evil. Let me say it again. Powerful things without restraint become evil and destructive, like electricity. Electricity is good if it's restrained. If it's not restrained, it's very bad. Fire is good. If it's not restrained, it's very bad. You see what I'm saying? We, we mistake in restraint as imprisonment when real godly restraint is empowerment. It helps you become better at who you are. It helps you become more powerful, more effective, more efficient. When we restrain electricity, we have lights. When we don't restrain electricity, we don't have lights and we can have a fire. Does that make sense? Am I helping y'all? Integrity. Last thing I'll say, and we'll just have to close it out. Integrity. <clears throat> always has personal restraint. Set your mind. Set your mind on things of the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You know what that means? If you set your things on the world, what will happen? You become like the world, and you, you, you also will gratify the desires of the flesh. So we have to set our mind, which also means I must tell myself, no. No, I'm not going to. Huh? Set our mind on things above. Right. It's one of the reasons why in the barracks we watch a secular movie once a week. We're supposed to. Because I want you guys to focus on the word. and You know, we're, we're purging ourselves. Scripture says that do not be conformed by the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? So the way that you save your body from destruction of sin and your mind is by mind renewal. That mind renewal is so pivotal to walking a life of freedom and walking a life of integrity, walking a life of sobriety and purity and righteousness. Amen? So if you find yourself continuing to go back to something, maybe you should ask yourself, why, what am I? What have I been struggling with in my restraints? Not, not. Oh, I. Have, you're never going to be able to talk yourself out of sin. Stop doing it. It's a dumb excuse. It's a dumb. That's a dumb. I've heard people say, "Well, just stop." You can't just stop. It's a mind renewal. It's a fixing your mind. See what I'm saying? I was to, I've told. We've said this before. The, the barracks is a program, but if you don't come here, you still have to do a program. You have to reprogram your brain. Right? That's the only way. Anyway, all right, I'm very quick.
Let's, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. <coughs> Lord, help it get in our hearts and help us walk in integrity, Lord. Become good stewards. Father, help us be a blessing everywhere we go. And help us, uh, help us complete the assignment you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.